the mighty middle. How many know Pastor has declared this season to be the season of transition? He, when he preached at the beginning of the year, he said, get ready. He'd been preaching to us about all the different aspects of transition and how we got to be courageous. We got to have a plan, all the things that he told us to do to prepare ourselves and to deal with it. Now, um, last year, Sam Chan was with us at our leadership conference and everything for our staff retreat. We talked about this, that when we transition, you know, you, you're going from a, a, a old um, paradigm to a new paradigm, whatever God is shifting in your life, you have a season of what he called the muddy middle. And as I reminded us, the pastor told us we are in that season of transition. So what is the muddy middle? It's that place where you are before you get to where God is taking you. you you're not where you were. You know, you can't stay where you were because God has shifted something in your life or given you a vision for something or prompted your heart and called you to do something. Sometimes it's something that you volunteered for. You got married and now you might be in that muddy middle, that place where you're still trying to work out to become in one part. Um, <laughs> Yes, son, you've been trying to get me to tell him what I was teaching all day. Bless his heart. He's a, he's a teacher in training, praise God. But uh, <clears throat> the muddy middle, you know, when we get to that posture where God is shifting us and he's doing something in our lives and we're not, like I said, able to stay where we were, but we're not where we ultimately will be. And so there's some discomfort usually in the muddy middle. There's some murkiness in the muddy middle. And I just want to talk about it because when you feel that discomfort, your, your inclination might be to be like the Israelites. You remember when they came out of Egypt and, and they said, we ain't got no food to eat. Why you bring us out here in this desert to die? You know, we, we left the, the Egypt where we were in bondage, but at least we knew what we could eat. You know, we, you brought us out here in this wilderness and you about to let us starve to death and we ain't got no water and they just whining, whining, whining. That's the muddy middle. They haven't gotten to the promised land, but how many know God has given them a promise? God has given you a promise. God has given you a vision. You're not going to stay where you were, but you're not where you're ultimately going to be. Yet. So there's a, a murkiness or, or like I said, it can be uncomfortable. You know, you can go through some stretching pains and growing pains, some difficulties, some challenges in that muddy middle. So how do you handle the muddy middle? Well, I'm glad you asked, because that's what we want to talk about. How do you handle the muddy middle? <clears throat> Let's talk about it. First of all, what does the transition timeline look like? You know, as to say, we're in a season of transition. How many of you are in a season? You you sense God is shifting you in some area of your life. I mean, no, I got several transitions going on. Praise God. Private life transition, work life transition, all kinds of professional, spiritual, ministry. you name it, God is shifting some stuff. How many of you all are experiencing a shift in your life? Amen. Let me see what y'all said in the chat. Anybody going through? Am I in this shift alone or is there anybody else shifting? Feeling a shift right now because Lord knows I'm feeling a shift. I'm feeling like I'm in the muddy middle. Yep, I see some other folks. I ain't alone. Praise God. Amen. And it doesn't have to be a, a bad thing. <laughs> Somebody said, tell me how to handle it. I'm okay. Amen. It could be a great change, a great transition. But still, you get that money now. So let's look at it. What's the transition timeline look like? Well, first of all, you have that vision or that promise or that thing God has directed you toward. So you have where you are, but God is showing you something different. I remember when I was raking leaves one day. I was probably in my 20s, I guess. And I remember the Holy Spirit showing me me preaching. Mind you, I'd never preached to anybody in my life. And I'm out there and I'm raking these leaves and I'm seeing myself preaching to people. And I'm saying, wow, now that was a bunch of years ago. 
And yet God gave me that vision. And then there is the muddy middle. So I'm leaving where I was, but I haven't right quite reached my destiny, the place where God has promised me. There's some things I have to go through in the middle before I get there. You know, the word of God says we go from glory to glory. But as one uh, pe preacher said, but there's hell in the hallway. <laughs> you, know, you got to get through that middle to get to the glory on the other side of that thing. And that can be a very stressful, challenging time. But we're going to talk about it. how do we handle it? Well, praise God. I'm glad you had. So we're talking about the in-between. Tell somebody the in-between. Tell your neighbor. If I was in church, I'd say, tell your neighbor. <laughs> we're talking about the in-between. How do we deal with that in-between? Well, let's look at it. We have a, a great example of how we cope with, deal with challenges. This doesn't necessarily have to be a muddy middle. This can happen and be appropriate and be applicable in any circumstance. But certainly, it applies in the muddy middle. Look with me, if you will, to what is probably a familiar text for many. And that is in the book of 1 Samuel. And we're going to look at chapter number 30. <clears throat> Turn with me there, if you will. If I, had, if I was back in the old church, I would say, read. You know, when we were growing up, the preacher would always have somebody, you say, read. <laughs> and they, stop, they bring out the, and then you say, stop right there. <laughs> All right. Yeah, y'all can see. I'm going to go again. All right. Pray for me. All right, chapter 30, verse 1 says, Now it happened when David and his men came to Ziklag on the third day that the Amalekites had invaded the south and Ziklag, attacked Ziklag and burned it with fire, and had taken captive the women and those who were there. From small to great, they did not kill anyone, but carried them away and went their way. Put a pen right there. David and his men, this is when that season when David was running from Saul. You know, Saul wanted to kill David because David was anointed to replace Saul as king. And how many know you can do what you want, but when God has ordained a thing, you can't change it. But they can make it miserable. So here's David. He kind of in that muddy middle. He got ordained, so to speak. He got anointed by Samuel to be the king. But yet there's a long transition. Some say 13 years, different estimates of how long it was. But it was a good while between when he got the vision, when he was told he would be king, and when that thing came to pass. He had to fight with a lot of people. He had to run for his life from Saul. He had to live in caves. He was living in foreign lands to keep Saul from killing him. Saul threw a spear and just barely missed his head. He could have killed Saul, but he recognized that wasn't his important his appointment. That wasn't his responsibility, nor was it his authority. When you have somebody in authority in your life, you don't get to kill them. You don't get to take them out. You do not disparage or, or cut them down or talk about them. You pray for them. Because what he said, I will not touch God's anointed. I wish I had some folks that understood that principle. I ain't got time to unpack it. But needless to say, in the muddy middle, David's running for his life. He got a band of, of uh, misfits in the sense, you know, people who were disgruntled, people who didn't have that. They all followed him. But he, of course, you know, he had a mighty anointed. And so he turned them into mighty men of God, warriors. But they left their family. They went off to fight and they left their family in Ziklag. So now they come back to Ziklag and they fought. They're coming back to rest and they get there and their whole little village, if you will, is burnt to the ground and all their kids are gone. All their property is gone. All their wives are gone. So that's where they find themselves. So verse three says, so David, and his men came to the city, and there was burned with fire, and their wives, their sons, and their daughters had been taken captive. Then David and the people who were with him lifted up their voices and wept 
until they had no more power to weep. You ever cry like that? You cry so hard, you ain't got no more tears. You just tired. Usually you just fall asleep. These are men, grown men, warriors, fighters. But yet when they came back and found their family gone, they just began to weep and cry to God. But look at verse five. Now everybody's family's gone, includes David's, their wives, their children, their property. Now verse five, and David's two wives, Ahinoam, the Jezreelitess, and Abigail, the widows of Nabal, the Carmelite, had been taken captive. Now, David was greatly distressed. So he's the man of God. He's the leader. You know, sometimes we put leaders on pedestals like they don't get hurt. They don't get tired. They should always be on. No, leaders are human just like anybody else. They get hurt like anybody else. Their feelings get hurt. They feel tired. They get drained. Every human emotion you feel they feel and sometimes we expect them to be god but there's only one god and he's doing a good job all by himself we don't we don't need to try to step into those shoes as leaders and sometimes people try to put us in that place and, and won't let us be human won't let us be a uh, flawed in any way and if we are showing any kind of flaw then we are criticized and put down because we weren't perfect in every situation but there's only one perfect amen so David was greatly distressed for the people. Watch this. Now, these are the people he's been taking care of. These are the misfits. These are the people he's been carrying on and, and, you know, guiding. They spoke of stoning him because the soul of all the people was grieved, every man for his sons and his daughters. But David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. So get the picture. I've been helping you guys. I've been leading you guys. I've been making sure you eat. I've been making sure your family had what you needed. You ain't had no money. You, that's why you follow me, because you didn't have anything. But I've been good to you. And when you get upset, you don't get angry at the enemy. You get angry at me. I don't know if you've ever been in a leadership position. And that's one of the things I'm going to talk about this year is leadership and the, and the requirements and the cost. But as a leader, Oftentimes you get blamed for stuff that you didn't even do. And especially if folks are mad at God, oh my goodness, they're going to take it out on you. When you are a leader, you got to bear the burdens of others while you're bearing your own burdens off the time. So here they are angry with David and they want to stone him because of what the Malachites, the enemy has done. Like I said, I can't unpack all that. That's a whole nother teaching. But what did David do? And this is what I want us to zoom in on, because this is what you do in the muddy middle. You haven't reached your destiny. You're going through hell in the middle. You're struggling. You, you're battling to survive because perhaps the circumstances you find yourself in are overwhelming. Now, people are treating you this, that, or the other kind of way, making you uncomfortable, you know, blaming you for stuff. You're going through all kind of emotions. What do you do? We're going to take a page out of David's book. David did not cower. David did not quit. David did not give in. Instead, what it says is, look at it again, in verse number six at the end, but David strengthened himself in the Lord. If you read one version, it says David encouraged himself in the Lord. How do I encourage myself, preacher? How do I get myself out of this mess? I'm in this muddy middle. God hasn't brought me the way I want to be. I can't go back to where I was. We're going to, again, follow his example. Encourage yourself. You know, yes, we want people to pray for us. Yes, we want somebody we can pour our hearts out to. And there's nothing wrong with those things. But sometimes you got to encourage yourself. Let's look at what that entails. First of all, God is your refuge, right? He's your hiding place. When the world feels like it's caving in on you and people are blaming you and people are attacking you and situations are discouraging you and circumstances are overwhelming you, you need to find your refuge. Your refuge is in God. How do I get there? 
I got to remind myself of what the word of God says. One of the easiest things to do is to wallow, to get in a place of despair and just say it. You know, have my little pity party, invite some friends over. <laughs> we just go whine and, and talk about how, how what's that word? Where nobody knows. <laughs> when you are in Christ, you don't have to stay in that place. Look with me at Deuteronomy 33. Deuteronomy 33 and 27. <laughs> Somebody might be saying, well, I ain't in no money middle. That's good. Just hold your breath. <laughs> stay right there where you are. You're going to need this because you're either going through something, coming out of something, or about to go through something. <laughs> That's how life is. It's cyclical. Deuteronomy 33, 27 says, the eternal God. That means God Almighty who was and is and is to come, who in the beginning was and in the end shall be. The eternal God is your refuge. And underneath, Think about a refuge. A refuge is a place, a shelter, a place that we hide, a place where we find safety, a, a place where we can uh, rest in our souls, so to speak. The eternal God, that's so important. We're not talking about a transient God. We're not talking about a fair weather God. We're not talking about a God who only shows up at certain times and hang ass at other times. The eternal God is your refuge and underneath are the everlasting arms he will thrust out the enemy from before you and i will and will say be sure in other words he will fight your battles can i get a witness up in here when things look their worst oftentimes when you're right on the precipice of your best it seems like the the storm comes before God's breakthrough comes. The enemy wants to distract. The circumstances will try to force you to get your eyes off the Lord. And if you allow it, you'll allow yourself to step outside of your refuge and get in your flesh and respond according to your own understanding and walking after your own ways. But no, hide in the Lord. Don't try to take the matter in your own hand. Don't repay evil for evil, the word of God says, but repay, overcome evil how? with love. So when we take our refuge in him, we're abiding in him. And y'all know what John 15 says, if you abide in me and my word abides in you, you can ask what you will and it shall be done unto you. When you abide in the Lord, when you take your refuge in him, you're saying, God, you're sovereign and I'm not. You're in control. I commit myself. I surrender myself. I come up under your arms, your righteous right hand. You be my refuge, God. You be my strength. I can't fight this battle on my own. So when you're in the middle and things are going tough, things are difficult, and honestly, this can be in any circumstance in your life. Go back to the source of your supply. Encourage yourself in the Lord. Remind yourself that God is your refuge. Look at Psalm 46 and 10. Like I said, I'm just sharing my sandwich with you. As I minister to you, I minister to myself. Amen. Psalm 40, I'm, I'm going to start at verse 1. I had put 10 because I did not think about 1. But let's look at 1. God is our refuge and strength. Good God Almighty. A very present help in trouble. Not a help that's down the road. Not a help that's on the way, but a very present help. So every time you're in trouble, you ought to be saying, if trouble's here, guess what? God's here too. I can look for God's strength. I can look for God to prov provide the refuge that I need in this very moment. I'm never alone. He will never leave me. He will never forsake me. So no matter whether I'm in a victorious zo zone or the muddy middle or wherever I find myself, God is with me and he's my refuge. And he's my strength. That means, like he told Paul, in my, my strength is made perfect in your weakness. So when Paul said, when I'm weak, I will 
post all the more because when I'm weak, I'm too strong. In other words, when I get to the end of myself, when I'm all empty, when I don't have nothing else, that's when God said, this is the time for Jesus to show up. This is his territory. This is when I show up because you stop trying to do it on your own and recognize you can't do it without me. But when I surrender all and say, Lord, have your way. I am yours. You are the master. I'm the clerk. That's when God can show up, show up, move in your situation because nobody's going to get the glory out of it but him. So he is your refuge. He's your strength. He's a very present help in trouble. Therefore, what? We will not fear. Even though the earth be removed, it could be an earthquake. It doesn't matter what happens. Even though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though its waters roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with its swelling, then come on down. To verse five, God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. Talking about the city of God, but we are his tabernacle. Come on, somebody. We shall not, point to yourself, say, I will not be moved. I shall not be moved. Why? Because God is in the midst of her. You are the dwelling of the Holy Spirit. You are the temple of Almighty God. God is in the midst, not only around you but he abides in you and he said he will live with you and in you how long forever so i shall not be moved this is the part i love god shall help her and in the king james it says and that right early in the new king james it says just at the break of dawn just when you were about to give up hope just when you thought it couldn't get any worse god will show up and help you but i love it right early you know, the old folks say he may not come when you want him, but he's right on time. And then I read my Bible and I said, wait a minute, I'm early. I ain't just on time. I show up early. The point is, no matter where I am in the process of transition, whatever I'm going through, I got to remind myself. I got to encourage myself. God is my refuge. God is my strength. God will help me. God will not forsake me. God is with me in times of trouble. Even when the mess is going on all around me, I can take refuge and remind myself, God is my strength. I, I hope this helps you because, hey, I'm preaching to myself. I don't know about nobody else, but God is ministering to me up in here, up in here. Look at verse number seven. The Lord of hosts is where? He's with us. If God be for me, who can be against me? The God of Jacob is our refuge. I need to just encourage somebody. In verse 10, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. When things look tough, God said, just be still and know that I am God. You can't fix this, but I got the solution. Rest in me. Take refuge in me. Be at peace. Be at ease in me. Might be craziness all around. It's like them commercials where you see the person walking through all kind of madness, but they got their earphones on, drinking their Coke, and everything is good. That's the kind of attitude you ought to have. I don't care hell, breaking loose, whatever's going on around me. I am at peace because I'm resting, resting under the refuge of God. I'm resting in the fact that I know God is with me. I need to get into the habit as a believer of looking for God. You know, a lot of times we're looking for trouble. We're expecting bad things to happen. Oh, if it wasn't for bad luck, I wouldn't have no luck. Baby, get out of the luck business. We ain't in the luck business. We walk in blessings. We walk in the refuge under the almighty hand of God. And when we do that, when trouble comes, you ought to be looking. Okay, God, how you going to work this thing? I can't, like a good movie, you know, you got your popcorn. You waiting to see what God going to do. <laughs> how he going to work this thing out? And it amazes me every single time that he shows up and he does exactly what he said he's going to do. Amen. So we talking about that muddy middle. How do I get through this muddy middle? I'm working with you. I'm hoping you get me because God is like a son. You're ministering to me. How do I handle this muddy middle? First of all, what happens in a time of a muddy middle? I feel uncertain. Anybody like that? You don't know how it's going to work out. You hope it's going to work out. 
But right now you can't see how it's going to work out and it's just stressful. You know, you feel uncertain. You're not sure. And most humans don't well, bode well with uncertainty. We like to know, you know, it's going to be this or it's going to be that. But when it's in the middle and you're not quite sure, it's kind of like on that roller coaster. You ain't where you was, but you ain't landed yet. You coming down that middle and your stomach is all in a knot and you're holding on like you can put on brakes. That's where you are when you're in that muddy middle. You haven't got there yet. You coming in and you're stressed and you're uncertain and you hoping. So how do I deal with that? What's the anecdote? What's the solution for my uncertainty? Well, I'm glad you asked. Let's look at the word. First of all, go with me to Malachi chapter number three, verse number six. Malachi. It's the last book of the Old Testament, just before Matthew. Malachi chapter three and verse number six. Let's see here what he does. He says, For I am the Lord, I do not change. Therefore, you are not consumed, O sons of Jacob. Why do I need to know that in my time of uncertainty? Because I need to be reminded whatever's going on around me, the God I serve will not, shall not, cannot change. It's like a rock that I can build my house on. You know that parable Jesus told with the people with the one built it on the sand and the wind came and just blew it away. But he said, the one that built it on the rock, winds came, waves came. I always used to say it's like the three little Christians. You know, one built their house on the sand and one on the straw, whatever it was, but the other one built it on the rock. And the Lord said, devil, you can huff, you can puff, but you can't blow my house down. When we are sure of who the God is that we serve, we are sure that he won't change that he won't forsake us then we can sit in a time of uncertainty and say it is well with my soul in hebrews chapter number 12 verse number two go there with me hope y'all brought your pencil and paper and your bible and your running shoes i got a few scriptures i want to go, go your way praise god Hebrews 12, let me go there, and see, all right, he says, looking unto Jesus, the author and finish of our faith, again, who is this that we have put in our hope in, the author, that means the one who wrote it, the one who initiated it but it also says the finisher. That means that he who has begun this good work in him will see through to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. That's what Philippians 1 and 6 tells us. So he's my, he's my initiator and he's my completer. He's the one who began this thing and he's going to see it to the end. What did God ever stop, start that he didn't finish? Jesus, the author and the finisher of what? Our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of his father. What's the point? When I know who Jesus is, I know that he always is faithful. He always stands firm on his word. He always completes what he began. I can rest assured that even though I don't understand right now, if he gave me the vision, he's going to bring it to pass. I might be in the middle right now. And I might not be seeing it the way I think it's going to ultimately be. But right now, while I can't see certainty in my circumstance, guess what? I can see certainty in my God. Look at Hebrews 13 and 8. He says, <clears throat> Jesus Christ is the same how much how many days? Yesterday, today, and guess what? Forever. So I can be certain of my God, even when I'm not certain of my circumstances. Am I making sense to anybody? Y'all, y'all understand what I'm saying? Your situation may look uncertain and unsure. It might look like God, how's this thing gonna come out? But come what may, the one thing you can always depend on is the Lord. He's never going to change. There's no shadow of turning with him. He is 
faithful. He is consistent and he is one that we can depend on. So there, yes, will be at times when we just feel uncertain. It just feel like, Lord, I don't know what's going to happen. I'm not where you promised me I would be, but I'm not seeing it manifest yet. I'm not seeing, you know, what you say is going to come to pass yet. But what I can see is that you are still with me. What I can see is you never leave me nor forsake me. What I can see is you are the author and you're going to finish this thing. Good God Almighty. You will not fail me. So that stuff I'm looking at could be uncertain. But that's why he said what? Fix your eyes on Jesus. That's that important. Because what you focus on is going to determine your attitude and your, your uh, outlook. If I'm looking at my situation, then I'm going to be discouraged because I don't see anything positive. Maybe I, I see confusion. I see muddiness. I see a mess. But if I'm focused on the Lord Jesus, I'm encouraged because I know he's good and his mercy will endure forever. I know he will never leave me. I know he's with me and I know he can be dependent on. Me. You know, some folks tell you, I'm going to do so and so. And you're like, mm, yeah, OK, let me. I believe that when I see it. But when Jesus says he's going to do it, you have the, the assurance that it's going to come to pass. So fix your focus on him. Because if I fix my mind on him, what does the word of God tell me? As a man, think of, as a woman, think of what? So is she. So if I'm thinking on the goodness of the Lord, it's hard to be scared. It's hard to be shaky. It's hard to be uh, worried when your mind is stayed on Jesus, when your focus is on him. Even when you walk into an uncertain situation, you can remind yourself, I don't know what these folks are going to do, but I know one thing. God is with me, and the God I serve will not change. We don't find our certainty, our, our what's the word I want, stability in people or in circumstances. We find our confidence, our stability in the Lord. Amen. All right. Amen. 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 I see y'all chatting up a store. Praise God. All right, let's look at the next thing. What else might you experience? I told y'all, I'm just sharing y'all my sandwich with you. You all, you might experience some stress and anxiety. Good God Almighty, in the muddy middle. You're not certain about nothing, stuff jumping off, people getting on your nerves, people coming at you like David, people blaming you for the situation you might not even have any control over, all this stuff. And sometimes it may not be necessarily negative. It's just when you're in a muddy middle, you're not settled. You feel a, a, a feeling of instability because you're just not on firm ground yet. You're in the middle. It's like, oh, can I just get settled somewhere? So that stress, anytime you have change, it could be a good change. Get married. Uh, it could be buying a house. It can be having a baby. Those things bring stress as human beings there's a natural tendency to stress and have some anxiety. Why? Stress has to do with a feeling of not having control. You know, having circumstances that we can't have control over brings stress. And what's the best thing? Release that control to the Lord. Take your hands off it and trust God. Let's look at what he tells us in the word. Look at Luke chapter 12 and verse 25. Because I'm trying to get through the muddy middle. I don't know about you. I'm coming out in the name of Jesus. And I'm coming out in peace. I decree it so in Jesus' name. Look at 1225. What's it say? Pardon me. And which of you, by worrying, can add one key? is his statue. What does it say? Worrying won't accomplish anything. Stress, anxiety. We know what Philippians 4, 6, and 7 tells us. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. But what does he tell us? If I'm feeling anxious, Peter says, cast your cares on me for I care for you. In other words, God doesn't want me stressing and walking around anxious 
He wants me to release the, the worry about not being able to control the outcome and leave the outcome to him. You can't add a piece of hair to your head. You can't add an inch to your height by worrying. You can give yourself an ulcer. Uh, you can get yourself sick. You can uh, trip your immune system because you're using all your energy to worry. Worrying really can have a devastating effect on your body. Some turn to drugs, some turn to drinking, some turn to sex. They turn all kinds of stuff to deal with that stress. But what if I turn to God and say, Lord, help me? I'm going to start back at verse 24 to put it in context. Consider the ravens, for they neither sow nor reap which have neither storehouse nor barn, and God feeds them. <laughs> this song is silly, but we were in service last Sunday, and Pastor Jenkins told this story about how they found a bird's nest over their house. And they, he said, first lady saw the bird's nest and said, take the nest down. And he got up there, and I guess they saw they had some little baby birds. He's like, oh, no, 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 leave the birds. He said, oh, no, them birds got to go. Because that's why you end up with other stuff in your life. You don't deal with it while it's a baby. And I said, yeah, because you know what? His eyes on the sparrow. He'll take care of them little birds. <laughs> they, like the word said, they neither sow nor, nor reap. They don't gather in the barns, but God feeds them. So we don't worry about them little babies. Anyway, that was just me being silly. So he says, of how much more value are you than the birds? If he's taking care of ravens, ravens are scavengers, kind of almost like the chickens of the bird species. They'll eat anything. But God takes care of them. So if he'll take care of them, how much more will he take care of you? So why do I need to be stressing and worrying if I know that God that I serve is going to take care of me? Verse 25 says, and which of you by worrying can add one cubit to his stature? If you then are not able to do the least, why are you anxious for the rest? You can't do nothing. What are you worrying about it for? Will worrying help anything? No. If you're going to worry while you're praying, and if you're praying while you want, they don't go to that. When I give God my petition, when I give him with thanksgiving, God has promised to meet me right where I am. Amen. He says, consider the lilies, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. If then God so clothes the grass, which today is in the field and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, O oh, you a little faith? And do not seek what you should eat or what you should drink, nor have an anxious mind for all these things the nations of the world seek out. And your father knows that you need these things. But seek what? The kingdom of God and all these things shall be added to you. In other words, if you're doing what God told you to do, then rest in him and know that he is going to take care of you. And as quiet as the don't tell nobody. But even when you mess up, God still loves you. God still watches over you. God never forsakes you. It's not in his MO. It's not in his character. He'd have to stop being God to be unfaithful. Thank you, Jesus. So we don't need to be stressing and worrying. We need to be praying and trusting the Lord our God. Amen. Oh, Look at Psalm 62, 5. And, well, while we're here, let's not flip right. The next thing I want to talk about that we may experience is fear. Now, we know the word of God tells us in Tim, 2 Timothy 1, 7, God has not given us the spirit of fear, but love, power, and a sound mind. But I want to also look at some other scripture that maybe we don't always think about when we're dealing with fear. Look at right there in Luke 12. Look at verse 32. Do not fear, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. So I don't have to be afraid because no good thing will he withhold from them who walk uprightly. If he began a good work in me, he's going to see it through to completion. If he gave me a vision, he's going to see it through to completion. Whatever God began, he finishes. So I don't need to be afraid. And if I'm concerned about my well-being, he said, why are you worried? Your father knows what you have need of, and he will provide. 
You do what he's asked you to do. What does that mean you get to lay around and be lazy? You do what he's directed you to do. Get a job, work with your part, but trust him to do the rest. It's kind of like the word of the day um, where we put our trust in things or in people instead of putting our trust in God. We need to trust the Lord our God. Fear is a tool of the enemy. If he can get you afraid, he'll be paralyzed. You won't do anything. And then he got you. But when we trust the Lord our God, we don't walk in fear. We may feel emotions of fear, but we don't let fear become our God so that we make directions or, um, or follow the directions that fear guides us to or let fear be our God. Now, look at Psalm 62. Five and six. Psalm sixty-two, five and six says what? I feel my help coming on. Come on, somebody. Help me. Jesus. Psalm sixty-two, five and six says, My soul waits silently for God alone. For my expectation is from him. Mm, mm, mm. That's balm to your soul right there. Wait on the Lord. And wait silently. Don't complain. Don't whine. That doesn't mean you don't get to share your heart. But don't make that a little G God. You know, some of us exalt our wretched. Um, maybe wretched is a harsh word. But, you know, our whining and complaining becomes more important to us than what the word of God says. We want to be a people who speak as much as we can. What did God say? I might not see it right now. I might not even understand it right now, but I'm going to trust you, God. I'm going to put my faith in you. He says, wait solidly for God alone, for my expectation is from you. Mm, I remember, I don't know, every time I see that word expectation, it takes me back to when I was pregnant with my daughter, 40 years old. Lord, help me, Jesus. And I remember falling down the steps. Sorry, Hamilton. Went through something else. Hamilton, I had more drugs. My, my gynecologist was like, you ain't had nothing else to do. <laughs> but I went through more drama. But the morning that I woke up realizing that God was doing something, I'll never forget. Because he took me to that word. I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are my thoughts of, are of good and not of evil. I'm paraphrasing because I didn't learn it in the King James, but I do remember this part. And it is to bring you to an expected end. In other words, I'm going to give you a hope and a future and bring you to an expected end. And I remember looking up to heaven when I was laying on the Guernsey hemorrhaging and they were saying, you miscarriage. And I remember looking up to heaven. I said, God, this is not the expected end. I refuse to let you go to your blessing. I refuse to hear the word miscarriage. I don't receive it in the name of Jesus. I need you to intervene. And how many know 22 years later, almost 23, here this little joker is still in my pocket. Pray that she get her a good job. <laughs> but what's the point? God has an expected in for me. I'm putting my expectation in him. I'm not putting it in my circumstance. I'm not putting it in my job, my husband, my money, my friends. I'm putting my expectation in God alone. Amen. So he says, let me keep reading. Verse six, he only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. God, I'm getting ready to shout up in here. I shall not be moved. Good God Almighty. I just need somebody to grab a hold of that thing. He, come on, somebody, is my, he only, underline that word in your book, in your Bible. He only is my rock. He the only thing I'm standing on. I ain't standing on you. I ain't, what my mom knew, she said, I ain't setting you. He is my only rock and my salvation. He is my defense. Come against me if you want to. You're going to be fighting with Almighty God. He is my defense. He done put some angels. You might not see them, but there's some angels around me right now protecting and keeping me in all of my ways. I shall not be moved. Whew. 
my, 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 my. That's my confession today. Anybody else? I shall not be moved in the name of Jesus. Come with me. I shall not be moved. Thank you, Lord, for your word. So when I feel afraid, I'm going to go to that word to remind myself. He's my defense. What am I afraid of? If God be for me, I'm more than a conqueror in Christ Jesus. Why am I allowing fear to dictate? Anybody ever done that? I can confess. I remember doing that one time and I regretted it ever since. I refused to let fear guide me. God is my refuge. God is my strength. He is my defense. He only is my rock and my salvation. Pray God and God. Somebody ought to grab a hold of that thing and run with it. Because if I wasn't teaching, I might get up and run around this room. Praise <laughs> God. I am so grateful for this word. Thank you, Lord. So what's my point tonight? In a time when you feel uncertain, in a time when things feel like you don't know which way to turn, things are going haywire, things are unsure, you're not clear, you feel anxious, whatever the case may be, where do you go? What do you do? How do you get through this muddy middle? You turn to God. And of course, you know, the all uh, the major, uh, I don't even know, is one of my favorites, but let's put it that one of, one of my references is to find myself in him in prayer. I want to share a couple more scriptures and then we're going to take your questions and pray. Look at Philippians 4 with me, if you will. Philippians 4. Because when we feel this uneasiness, this uncertainty, this, this place of uh, dis-ease, so to speak, from the muddy middle, anchor yourself, remind yourself of these principles so that you can get through it. Philippians 4, 6, I quoted it. Be anxious for what? Nothing. But in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. So what do I do when I feel all those feelings, anxiety, fear, whatever? I'm going to go to God. I'm going to remind myself first by renewing my word, mind and his word and reminding myself that he is the eternal God, that he is my strength, that he is my defense, he's my rock. Once I get that inside of me, now I'm going to pray with more confidence, right? And watch this. And the peace of God, verse seven, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your heart and mind. See, when I'm in the word like that, instead of being stressed out and anxious, I go back to the word. And where the world is coming at me, all the situations, the muddy middle, the uncertainty, his word now is guarding my heart, guarding my mind like a a, a helmet. He's protecting me, keeping me from losing my mind up in here, up in here. When we give God all of our prayers, all of our petitions, with thanksgiving, he gives us a peace that surpasses. That means it's greater than your capacity to understand. How can I have peace? I'm looking at my situation. I'm uncertain. I'm in the middle. Blah, 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 blah. And he said, guess what? Even with all that, if you cast your care on me, I'll give you a peace that'll surpass your understanding. And when it guards your heart, that means he's protecting your heart. It that represent the center of your being, the core of who you are. He's protecting that so the enemy can't take you out, so the circumstances can't overwhelm you, so people can't destroy you. He's guarding you. But it starts with you giving him those burdens, passing those cares, praying with confidence. And you can meditate on verse eight. Finally, my brother, here are the things I want you to think about to keep your heart and your mind at peace. Whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report. If there's anything, any virtue or new NIV says anything praiseworthy, I'm sorry, my bad, he says it here too. And if there's anything praiseworthy, Meditate on these things. Philippians 4 8. Meditate on these things. 
And I love it. One of the young ladies was in my class years ago. I taught the battlefield of mind. She taught me something. She said, when that thought come, I filter it through verse eight. She said, I stop and I say, okay, is this thought that I'm thinking uh, true? If it ain't true, it's got to go. Is this thought noble? In other words, is it a good thing? Am I focusing on something good or negative? Whatever things are just, is this a just thought? In other words, she filters it through. If it can't find itself under one of these rubrics, then it's got to go. See, you got a power over your mind. The thought can come, but you only have to let it stay if you choose to. Like a bird in a, a bush, you can sway, swap that thing and it'll fly away. You can take that thought captive and bring it under captivity and subjection to the word of God. Now I'm going to choose to think on something praiseworthy. I'm going to choose to think on something that is noble, something that's pure, something that's true. I pick my thoughts. I'm not letting them just hang around and just show up and, and take over my mind just because they happen to show up. And that's a critical part in the muddy middle because you'll sit there thinking about all the muddiness and all the mess and all the stuff you don't like and all the people and blah, 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 blah. No, I'm going to dismiss all that and I'm going to refocus. It's like your car. If you hit enough bumps, it gets out of alignment. What do you do? You take it back to the mechanic and they readjust. So now you're pointing straight. Sometimes you got to go back and readjust your mind. You got to renew your mind in the word and remind yourself. Whenever I find myself feeling, hearing myself say things that don't sound noble, I say, Oops, I need to go back, rewind, reset, refocus, and get myself back on track because the devil is a liar. I'm not going to sit here and let you stress me out. But guess what? We have a choice and we allow ourselves to go along with it. When I said something a minute ago, I don't want you to miss this. This is my last scripture. Look with me at Hebrew because I talked about when I'm renewing my mind, it then gives me the capacity to pray bold prayers. After I've looked at the word, I'm reminding myself of who God is. Man, I'm like, dun, 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 dun. Superwoman, because <laughs> I'm built up in the power of God now. I can pray down heaven now because I'm believing God based on what He told me. This is one of my go to. It's my, 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 uh, one of my nuclear weapons. I'm, I'm letting you in on some good stuff right here. So you mark this in your Bible. Go to Hebrews chapter four. This is one that'll get me every time in a place where I'm like, okay, God, I can do this thing. Verse number 14, Hebrews 4 and 14. Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the son of God. Now, high priest had to be appointed by God. And of course, they were a model in the Old Testament of the revelation of the real high priest, Jesus who makes intercession for us. Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses. So while I'm in this muddy middle or whatever my situation, I'm reminded Jesus not only walked here on earth, he passed through the heavens. And because he walked as a man, he gets me. Tell somebody, he gets me. Tell yourself, he gets me. He been where I've been. He walked where I walk. He can sympathize with my situation. He understands my weakness. He ain't pointing at me saying, you should know better. You're a preacher. He understands sometimes even preachers fall short of the glory of God or preachers get weary or preachers get tired. Whatever the case may be, he gets me. Guess what? Because he got tired. That's why when they killed his cousin, John the Baptist, the next thing you see, he on a boat going to the other side. He needs some rest. He tired. Just like us, he went through it all. So that made him better able to understand our situation. He says, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are. What have you been tempted to do? Drink, Lord. Uh, lay down with, get up, whatever. What have you been tempted by? He was tempted in every way. We didn't think about that. How many of them honeys rolled up on Jesus and said, mm, you looking kind of good. I like the way you laid hands on that dude. Can we get together? 
Can I slip you my um? I ain't had no phone. Let me write in the sand where I live. <laughs> he couldn't give you a phone number. Let me let me put it on a, a piece of dirt down here. You can come back and figure it out. What's the point? He was tempted in every single way we were. Whatever you're tempting, maybe he was saying, "Here, just drink some, Jesus. You'll feel better." After they killed your cousin John. No, every single thing we went through, he gets us. Yet without sin. That's the good news. Because if he had sinned, if he had taken the bait when the enemy said, turn this bread and this rock into a brick, he wouldn't have been perfect enough to die for my sins and yours. And how many know, thanks be to God, his pure blood was enough to wash me whiter than snow. So because he was tempted, he understands my weakness. He gets me. He can empathize. He can sympathize with what I'm going through. And look at verse 16. This is where it all comes together. Let us therefore what? Come holy to the throne of grace. See, I'm not going to talk to somebody hoping that they're interested. You ever had to talk to somebody you can see they really don't want to hear you. They busy. They ain't hardly even looking up from their desk. It's like you trying to get their attention with hoping they paying attention. No. He says, come boldly. That means don't come reservedly. Don't come meekly and half-heartedly. No, come boldly. I'm right here. Listen, I get it. I know what you're going through. I walk that earth. I see them jokers. I get you, baby girl. Come boldly before the throne of grace. Without reservation, come before this throne. And guess what you're going to get? That we may obtain mercy. How many need some mercy? See, mercy is what I get when I done done something that I deserve punishment for, right? I messed up. I need some mercy, God. I can't even say I deserve you to do nothing. I can't just say I was right. I didn't, you know, flip off at somebody. Whatever the case, I need some mercy, Lord. But he said, guess what? Come boldly and you can get it. Make me think, y'all, you know what? I don't know what. It must be the word that got me high up in here because I'm just feeling like I just drank, I mean, ate my spinach. I'm feeling like Papa, good God Almighty, I could pray heaven down right about now. God said, come boldly to the throne of grace. You're going to get mercy, baby girl. I'm not going to look at you and judge you, son. I'm not going to put you down. I'm not going to tell you why did you do this. I'm going to give you the mercy that you need. Thank you, Lord, my Lord. And watch this, find grace. That means why you deserve punishment, I'm going to give you blessings. I'm going to give you favor, Lord Jesus. You deserve a word, but I'm going to bless you. Grace is unmerited, unearned, undeserved favor. That means he blesses you in spite of the fact that you don't deserve it. Thank you, Lord. It's all right here for you. But here's your part. You got to come. I can't make you come. Of course, God is sovereign. He can make you, but he gives you free will. I'm not going to make you come. But if you'll come boldly, then I got some grace and mercy waiting for you. How many have forfeited the grace and mercy of God? Because they won't humble themselves and go before his throne. How many have forfeited peace in their mind and guarded heart and guarded mind in Christ because they won't go to the throne and talk to him? No, they're going to go tell their girlfriends. They're going to do all this stuff, but they're not going to seek the Lord our God. What's the point? When you're in the muddy middle, you blew your mind in the word. Remind yourself of who God is. Encourage yourself in the things of God. And then go before God and tell him all about it. And find the mercy and the grace that you need. David knew that. That's why David didn't fight. David didn't cuss. They didn't get, he didn't get caught up in pretending, oh, what's the word? Uh, defending himself. You know what I did for y'all? And now y'all going to, no, he didn't do any of that. He turned to God. And he encouraged himself. He said, y'all jokers ain't going to encourage me, but I'm going to encourage myself in the Lord. That's how you get through the muddy mud. Amen.
Amen. Do we have any questions? 